I have been with PwC for um, just over 12 years now. I have actually been in the role of head of talent acquisition for about 12 minutes, so I'm slightly nervous today. <laughs> um, if I do fluff my lines, which I know I will, I give you all permission to uh, heckle me. Um, but I wanted to take you on the journey that we have been on at PwC for a couple of years now, when we woke up to the fact, like many of us, um, or all of us in the room, that the talent pools are drying up um, and we needed to kind of look at things slightly differently. Um, I think the fact that I've been in this role for 12 minutes has given me the unique opportunity to also go in and be that annoying person that asks those annoying questions when you're really, really busy um, about why we're doing things a certain way and whether we could do it better. So I'm sure my team are loving the fact that I'm not here today. Um, so I thought I would start with a quote from one of my newly found idols, um, Josh Burson. Um, and he talks about the shift that we all need to make in um, creating candidates um, and not just attracting candidates. Um, really nice article. And I think um, some of the things from that article that, that, that come to mind when I, when I, when I read that was um, it's not just about hiring people anymore. And it's not about that frantic, oh my god, we need to get 100 people in the office by Monday in order to help our clients. It's about having a more strategic lens around who we're bringing into the organization from that talent pool that have the potential um, to grow and to keep growing and to keep create, recreating themselves um, within our firm as our firm changes. Um, there's a big part of that which is also about our um, ability to train these candidates. Um, so it became very apparent to me very quickly that um, the two polar opposite worlds of the HR functions, TA and learning and development, actually need to be very closely joined at the hip in order to achieve um, the fact that we need to bring in the skills that our future firm needs, but we also need to support and, uh, and train them along the way. Um, we also need to think differently about um, the available talent pools out there, and it's something that I'm, I'm really passionate about and love about the role. Um, Having the opportunity to replicate the different demographic that exists in society from a diverse and inclusion perspective, I think, is a real privilege in a position like this. And it's a real opportunity to challenge where we think our available talent pools are. Um, so right from young people right through to um, the mature workers and everyone in between. Um, very recently, uh, we as a firm did some work with a not-for-profit called Impact 21, and we actually, who um, look to find gainful employment for people with Down syndrome. And I'm really proud to stand here today to say that we actually have people with Down syndrome working in our organization, which 10 years ago would have been a thing of, 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 of dreams. Um, as I mentioned, it's about the shift that talent acquisition, I think, needs to make and needs to make quite quickly. Our firm uh, is still very focused on the external market and where we're getting that talent from. We need to absolutely reshift that focus. So we're looking internally, again, working with our colleagues from a learning and development to making sure that we're spotting the talent that we've got, um, but using the data and the insights where we can to identify the softer skills that we need, that we know will be successful in different roles, um, either in a new firm um, as we change or in a new area of the firm. And if I think about the the PwC as a firm, it's probably done that in piecemeal. And I think the opportunities are probably too, too driven by the employees. So it's the employee going, I want that global succumbent or I want to shift from assurance to consulting. Whereas I believe we need to build that um, systemically into our, our workforce so that we're actually promoting that more and engaging more. If I think about my own career, um, I started in 2008 as a resource administrator in the London office and um, moved client facing into our consulting practice for a number of years before moving to Sydney um, and then decided to move into HR to lead the change for our own global workday rollout. Um, if anyone is planning to do that, I'm available for numerous glasses of wine because you will need it. Um, and as I said 12 minutes ago, I started in head of talent acquisition. So um, I've had the ability to move around and I've had the ability to, to push my skills and, and to see where we go. But that's largely been driven by me and the opportunities that I create. And I think there's a shift that we need to make. Before I move on from this slide, I just wanted to bring um, one um, example into this around the, the different talent pools, and that is our higher apprenticeship scheme, which we started a couple of years ago. 
Um, every day there's an article in the AFR about this scheme at the minute and it's where we attract uh, 16 to 18 year olds and we bring them into our organisation and offer them part-time work while they study part-time for a diploma in technology. The really exciting thing I think about this is 83% of that first cohort, which was a couple of years ago, um, have already been promoted, which is an exceptional achievement given the complication, the, the complexity of our firm. Um, but I think really um, stands to the test that um, work experience is, is fundamental alongside a good education. If I bring it broader out to Generation Z, um, I had the opportunity to listen to a talk by the Stillmans, who are a father and son duo from um, America. Um, very engaging, very candid. Um, the son is obviously Generation Z, the father is obviously not. Um, and they were talking about the differences of um, Generation Z and the impact that that will have on our workplace. Uh, today, 15% of our workplace in Australia is made up of Generation Z. Um, that will start to double in the, in the coming years. Um, excitingly, 72% of that population here in Australia no longer believe you need a degree to be successful. And 61% of those um, are actually willing to stay with the company for 10 years or more, um, which again is a, a, a great opportunity for us all in a, in a shrinking talent pool. Um, so I want to take you on a bit of a journey um, with PDBC because I, I fundamentally believe that as a firm we actually took a step back in order to take several leaps forward, um, especially as technology um, and algorithms and data and the insights that was providing um, were kind of coming at us with full force. Um, I believe we needed to get the basics right first, which we did. So these numbers in front of you, they are quite daunting. They do keep me awake at night sometimes. Um, but if I'd have given this speech uh, a couple of years ago, we probably wouldn't have been able to put this on the, on the, on the screen because we really struggled to get headcount data. Um, it took us so long and it was so painful that the data was so out of date by the time that I would have created this slide. And if we can't um, gather basic information such as headcount data, we're probably going to struggle as a TA function to understand what skills we have amongst that headcount. So we're really trying to, we were really back in the day trying to fix um, not what was broken, but what we could do better in, in today's world before we moved into the kind of advances of data and insights. Um, more locally, we have a population of 8,500 people. We process over 100,000 applications every year for just over 2,500 people on average every year. Again, historically, that was all done manually. The TA team were drowning in Excel spreadsheets, phone interviews, screen interviews, face-to-face -face interviews, booking rooms, um, appointments, welcome rooms, all of that kind of stuff was done manually. Um, and I feel the real shift that the, the technology and the data is now giving us is the ability to remove the mundane, but also then demand that more strategic table, strategic seat at that table, because we're able to lift ourselves up from that, to give ourselves the mental capacity to look at that data and to have the capacity to do something differently with it. Um, but I don't actually believe um, it is just the data or the numbers or the insights that, that are actually giving, which has really helped our firm going forward. The biggest shift I see from when I first joined the firm to now um, is probably the culture. And I think we took PwC, uh, we gave it a really good shake and we turned it on its head. And I think what that did was um, simplify our internal workings um, to give us um, and change um, systemic change behavior across our organization, which is very difficult when it's a partnership. And I'm sure there are others in the room who understands the mechanics of a partnership. Um, but what that's allowed us to do, I think, is two things. One, we have a different mindset towards data now, so we're able to look at that data but listen to what it's actually trying to tell us. And two, as we remove the complications and the unnecessary noise from our organisation, we're actually giving ourselves the headspace to actually do something with that data. So I believe it's actually the shift in the culture um, and the journey I want to talk through today that, that, that's allowed us to do, to do that. So, um, as we woke up to the fact that the workers were disappearing and the world was getting more complex and it was only going to get more complicated, um, someone wrote a business case for change. It was probably the easiest business case to write in the world and I wish that had been my job for a while because um, I think the, that slide could be the business case and it would be over. Um, but some of the external factors that were driving our, our business case were the fact that 69% um, of us are finding it really hard to fill roles. Um, 
And if I think about that stat, I think it's just going to increase um, as the world becomes more complex. But as we're all grappling with what the future of work actually means when you break it down to the skill sets that we require, short term, medium term and long term, um, I could absolutely guess that we'll probably need people like the chief ethics officers or the um, privacy um, controllers or anything to do with AI. But breaking that down across a full organization like PwC is actually very complicated, especially when we're running at the speed that we run. 78% of Australian CEOs see that the, the shrinking talent pools is their top um, threat to economic growth. Um, and in the PwC context, I think that's um, heightened because back in the day, our competition, um, we had a huge talent pool and our competition was the big four. So it was the Deloitte's, the KPMG's and the EY's of the world. That's now um, changed and um, we're now competing against all the tech houses for, these, for this talent. Um, so our talent pool is shrinking and our competition is getting harder. Um, and I think that the kind of the other point to this slide is the fact that if you'd have asked me in 2008 what Google did, I probably wouldn't have been able to tell you, but I would have been able to tell you that they were a pretty cool place to work. Um, and I think that with this um, behavioral change and kind of journey we, we, we've been through, we woke up to the fact that it's not just attracting that talent, it's about what we need to do to create a value proposition that is both different in the market, but also personal and speaks to me as an individual um, and, and speaks differently to the other 250,000 employees that we have across the firm. Internally, um, I think with any organization, we were facing the same problems. We had systems that absolutely belonged in the dark ages. Um, very frustrating, very clumsy, didn't really talk to each other. Um, and again, if you overlay that with the fact that the Generation Zs are now coming, um, we knew we had to do something uh, quite radical quite quickly. Um, the Gen Zs are so used to technology that they don't even expect to see that on a value proposition. They just expect that you've got the fancy digital waterfalls and you've got the fancy laptops with a, with a good battery that can last for a day. Mine's not quite there yet. Um, so we knew we had to do something there. Um, it was around the simplification of our firm. So we had many vendors um, globally that all did a similar but different thing which meant that we as the end users were engaging with these different systems to do a similar but same thing um, and creating a lot of unnecessary noise and duplication across the firm. I feel like we're making progress here. We've, we've always been um, um, members of a network firm rather than a global um, organization. We are much more focused on a global organization now and make much more strategic longer term decisions about our technology roadmap and about the integrations to make sure that Everything where possible is talking to each other and everything looks shiny from the outside and um, regardless of what our teams are doing on the internal side of things while we're, while we're making them all pretty. Um, I won't labour the facts here. Um, I think 45 days to, to produce a, a headcount report um, is obviously crazy um, and we just needed to throw it in the bin by the time we'd done it. Um, the cost of doing that as well was just over 70 million US dollars per year. Um, and I, the one thing I think that sticks out to me there is actually the roles of the individuals that were, were making this cost. It must have been such a, a mundane role for them to be pulling this data and so frustrating. The number of phone calls they had to do, the number of pivot tables they had to do, the fact that they had to make the number look real because they weren't too sure. So they added a couple of decimal points and then it all of a sudden looked real. Um, but that's a great opportunity of how technology is now coming into play because it is removing that mundane um, tasks and, and, and helping us be better at what we do by working alongside um, the technology. So as I said, um, the broader transformation that we've been on um, was a real opportunity for us to prepare for um, the technology onslaught that is coming at us within the fifth industrial revolution. Um, I read a really cool fact, which I'll probably get wrong um, last week. It took um, 73 years for 100 million people to gain access to a telephone. Um, it took one month for the same number of people to get access to Pokemon Go. I, I, and it's just astounding. I think it just really tells you the, the pace of change that is happening and the speed at which this revolution is coming at us. 
Um, but from a, from a firm-wide perspective and some of the broader changes, I think what we did really well was, and kind of in, in line with the theme of the last two days, is, is focus on two things. The first one being the human involved in all of this and what we need to do to, to care for them in a compassionate way, but also what we needed to do with the tech and how we work together to bridge that gap. So as a firm, we've invested three billion US dollars. Um, there's, ever since I updated my LinkedIn profile, I think a lot of vendors have seen that because I have become more popular than, than Beyonce in the last couple of weeks. Um, all that's being spent internally, by the way. Um, we're all going through digital academies, so every single employee of the 250,000 will go through a two-day digital um, immersion event. Um, we've actually pulled digital champions out of our business, which I think is an exceptionally different way of thinking for our firm. So they're no longer constrained by utilization targets or revenue targets or people metrics. And they're free to sit within their business unit to have that capacity to think differently about what this data is doing for our organization and how we could do things in a better, more informed way, importantly, at the local level that is the business unit. We're simplifying our approach. Um, a, a good example here, which I'll come on to in more detail later, is the use of Pymetrics within our graduate, within our graduate um, campaign. Um, it, it truly is gamifying the approach, but it's simplifying how we work um, with our graduates. And some really cool statistics, which I'll come on to um, in a couple of slides. Um, we've transformed our HR. I think our HR functions went from being siloed into the business unit um, to a centralized function that went siloed into the business unit to a centralized function that now goes together into the business unit to solve the same problems that we all have, but hopefully in a new and different way because we have the diversity of thought around the table and we're also powered by analytics and data. Which brings on to the, the fourth point there is around the access to data. So having removed um, as much of the unnecessary noise as we possibly can, we're now able to spend more time talking about what the data is saying. Um, accountants love data. Um, and what I love about this love for data is the fact that it helps us remove the human from that decision, not completely, um, but remove that human bias from that decision to make us make better informed business decisions quicker, which I'm sure we're, we're all aiming for. Um, so if I think about where we're going from um, a, a kind of HR space. So I said we've transformed. We went siloed into the business, and now we're going siloed together. And um, this was this has come from a recent report um, from our, our, our global firm, um, and it talks about the five key things that we think we need to do as organisations to truly differentiate ourselves in the market, but also to kind of play that fair game in that that war on talent. And I think it's no different from a HR perspective. Um, so the first one here, um, obviously, is the obvious one. We need to understand the skills of our business, and we're absolutely now engaging with technology and data to help us understand what those soft skills are, but also those technical skills. To take that one step further, we're looking at the gaps um, that people have, both from their annual reviews, um, but also what they're telling us, but also from a, from, a, from a technology perspective that looks at the underlying behaviors that we need from an individual and starts to map and plot that against, that, against some heat maps that simply says, um, Rob is over here, but he'd also be really great over there. And here's the gap. Let's help, let's help him fill that. The second one is obviously understanding the technology itself. So I think the digital immersion events will help us um, help all of our people make the most of, of what the data is saying, because I think it's really important. We're inundated with different bits of kit now that can do different things. Um, but we need to make sure that we don't leave anyone behind and we need to make sure that we're all very comfortable with the technology in order to make the most of what it's showing so it can have the biggest impact. We need to engage um, with educators and the government. Um, I think the one piece that's missing from my role at the minute um, is the opportunity to just have a chat with um, educational institutions that are out there to make sure that we're not starting to compete with each other, but, but, absolute, but absolutely work together so that we're training the younger populations in a way that our future firm actually needs. Um, if I think about the Generation Zs and that stat earlier, it, 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 it does scare me because of the kind of the shift to I don't really need a degree anymore. And, and what is the impact on that downstream and how can we as an organization play an important role to, to solve for that problem? 
Um, fourth is around diversity and inclusion. Um, and as I said, this is probably the, the, the one piece of the puzzle which, which made me want to go for this role. Um, the red days recently where I wish I'd stayed where I was, but it's uh, all in all, it's, it's been a great role. But I think the opportunity and the privilege to actually influence the diversity and inclusion of our firm has been great. Um, we do wonderful things with diversity and inclusion, and I think we were one of the early adopters um, who, who, who quickly woke up to the fact that diversity of thought is very, very important when we think about the fact that the talent pools uh, are decreasing, but our client problems are getting more and more complex. Therefore, we need people who think differently who will then charge everyone else to think slightly differently. Um, and then the fifth one, I don't really know what to say, given the political environment that we currently work within with um, Boris and Brexit and Trump. But we need to make a way to help us all move more freely across um, the globe so that we can access that talent. One thing I think locally from a, um, a talent acquisition at PwC perspective is the opportunity for technology is ripe in that space. We need a way of accessing that talent very quickly and we need a way of being able to mobilize that talent very quickly. Um, and then if I look to the future of, of where we're going from a, from a talent acquisition perspective, um, this is another um, infographic that was published by the PwCC CEO um, in the US. Um, I saw this on LinkedIn and it popped up one morning. And I think the one thing that, 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 that shook me um, in a good way was the opportunity that sits within the talent acquisition team to truly modernize um, the HR function as a whole. Um, I think a long, for a long time now, the HR functions have felt like we're doing enough to support the businesses, but the feedback from the businesses is that we actually need more from you. And I think the secret sits within, um, a part of the secret um, sits within the talent acquisition space. And obviously, um, a, a greater approach on that full stack of HR, especially with our learning and development colleagues. Um, and then just to come back to some examples that we currently use, and, and we have a long way to go with technology, but I think um, now we've got the basics right and we've laid the foundations, we're absolutely doing some wonderful things with the different technologies that are out there. Um, you can see, um, so within our graduate uh, recruitment campaign, um, we process 25,000 applications in a five week period. Um, we're currently open for our campaign at the minute. Um, we used to do that manually. It was a superhuman effort by a very small team. Um, their mental health and well-being took a hit because it was just so busy. Their ability to remain unbiased from the process was a concern. Um, we had to make a way for that, that whole process to be more engaging for the candidates that were out there that were just getting quite frustrated with the process um, from a company that was seemingly quite shiny on the outside. Um, so Pymetrics have, help, have helped us to gamify the approach. Um, that has driven um, efficiencies through the roof all while we are receiving more and more applications every year. Um, but more importantly, I feel it's actually driven the candidate experience through the roof as well. So they're actually talking about us, they're engaging with us. Um, we do watch their social media channels, which gives me a bit of a heart attack every day because they are very honest in their own unknown social channels which they have with each other. But all in all, um, their experience with us is good. At the bottom there, um, LinkedIn Insights, um, I think it's probably been around for a while. I don't think we use it enough yet. Um, we are using this now, um, again, to get that strategic seat at the table to help make informed decisions. Um, if I get one more phone call about high levels of attrition and it being talent acquisition's fault, I may scream. Um, I really don't understand how the two interact with each other there, but what I do understand is that with the insights we can take to the table and kind of have an informed decision about why our people might be leaving and what we can do about it from the data that exists from a global market and also where that talent population is and where they're moving to and from. Um, and then finally, I thought I'd leave you with a bit of a quote, which is one of my favorites, but which I think talks quite nicely um, to the, the theme of today. Um, it's not about the technology itself, rather how we manage the human tech interface with compassion and integrity. Thank you. Uh, uh, Rob, uh, uh, fantastic. Thank you for sharing. And before you stay, I got one question for you. Mm -hmm. uh, and it was bubbling and you, as you were wrapping, put it to, uh, to a point. It's this, is you can have a discussion around why people are leaving, because you said you're just going to lose it if, if someone says it's talent acquisition's fault. For me, it begs the question, who 
is having that discussion. Because yeah. as we talked about before, we haven't had the governance in many organizations in place to actually have a discussion around why the flow is what it is and what we can do to improve it. Because oftentimes it's comp, oftentimes yeah. it's learning, oftentimes it is recruiting. So can you speak to who's having those discussions? And if it's, A, you're aspiring to get to a different place, maybe you know, it lies in that. Yeah, no, and one classic example from a, from a business unit we do have with a high attrition rate, um, a, a meeting we had last week where we took the, the my counterparts into the room to have a discussion around. So we had our performance and reward lead at that table. We had our learning and development lead at that table. We had me at that table. Um, we had our wellness team at that table as well. The problem I think we have is that there was like 10 HR SMEs and two business partners. So it felt a bit like a, a client pitch that you've got wrong because you'd taken way too many people to solve the argument. So I don't know how we solve for that yet, but mm. um, we're absolutely trying to, to come together as one force. Get there. All right, Rob, thank you again. Thank Super you. appreciate it. Well done.